The piece in today's demonstration is the crosshead, item 7. This is cast and it's bronze. Let's take a look at the casting. I think you can see there is a left-right mismatch in this casting, which is going to affect somewhat, but I mean if it's mismatched, it's mismatched. You have to make the best with what you have. We're going to start this in a very unique fashion. I think you're going to like the way I start it. I am going to make a little jig for it. Super simple little jig that's going to save a lot of aggravation in setup. And let's take a look at the features. Uh, it's called out as an inch 125. And I'm going to try to put some metric conversions on this. So I hope that that works out that way. But that's the intent. 1 inch 125 center to the end. Uh, from what I can see on this drawing, there is nothing calling out end to the center. Okay, we do have center to the end. This is called out. All the dimensions that are drawn like this are usually assumed to be symmetrical. So that is assumed about a central feature and that feature is the center line of the 1032 hole in the end. That is just about a five millimeter hole if you want to get around to feeling how big that is. Now the function of this, this is the part that slides in the frame. Ultimately, this frame right here, and I am looking forward to doing this, but I'm going to hold off on this because this has already been done. We've already seen it done once, so I'm going to try to not overlap components that have already been shown. This guy right here, I am fairly sure, sits in this track and articulates back and forth. As the crank comes around, there's linkage on this end, there's linkage on this end, and there is a bridge on either side trapping this from coming up and the features that will be milled into this shape those bosses right there ride down in this track and keep it aligned this way so this is a very constrained part and once you approach this part you should try to determine what is important initially and the, what I can see as far as important is concerned the thickness of the bosses are very important because they need to ride in this track and the parallel and planar relationships between the two ears. You do not want this part dimensionally to be higher or lower than the identical feature on the opposite side. It may be dimensionally within conformance but if it's five thou higher on this side than it is on this side it could sit in there crooked, it could bind, it could cause a lot of problems. You also want the slot in the front to be true and perpendicular to the slide surfaces on the side. That way any hard linkage that's in there is not cocked. Well, the hole is round as round, so that's really not going to matter, so long as it's in the center or close thereabouts. But the geometry of the outside is what we're going to shoot to achieve. And you're going to have to start somewhere. So I am going to start by visually aligning uh, when I once I get to it, I will align the round feature on the end because it is, well, they tried to get around. I'll align that with a pin, come up with my center, and establish the end of the part. Work from there. This little guy here in the center, this is also a protrusion intended to add support around the thread. But it's a small thread and that's an awful lot of mass, so I really can't see that that makes a whole lot of difference. Unfortunately, it will get in the way when you try to machine it, because it is proud of that surface. Well, I'll bet you I have a creative solution to that. Let's get this thing on the machine, get it done. It is five minutes after one, real time. I do not have anything staged for this build. This is ice cold as of right now. See how long it takes. With the aid of a parallel and some helper blocks, I am going to come up with a little creative setup to allow me to file off the mismatch on the front of this thing and make it look more round. That's my starting point. Cosmetic first. Take that line out. Just got a gut feeling. Needs to be done. Let's see what happens. You can see how I use the helper blocks. The parallel is there because the center of these curt vices has a relief as the uh, articulating surfaces slide under each other and the blocks would fall in. So to keep them vertical, I have a parallel underneath of them. 
that secures this part extremely tight and gives me a good base for blending with the file. I could put this on a belt sander, but I don't want to overdo it. Start there. I'm going to start with an extremely coarse file and finish the blend with an extremely fine file. Wider the better. Don't go after this with little tiny baby files and, and uh, take all day because all you're going to do is dig a bunch of scratches and troughs into this piece. Use as big a file as you can and watch the width of the flat that the file leaves. That will be a very good indication of which way you are biasing or putting excessive pressure one side or the other on the file. Keeping the file centered with a gentle pressure against my finger, I can regulate the track of the file by moving my thumb. I need a little bit more vertical projection here. There is a large difference in the aggressive nature of the file I'm using from the first one. With the first file, blend until you see the casting marks gone. With the second file, blend until you see the remnants of the first file gone. With any kind of look, it'll feel around when you're done. I'm going to take it over to the blaster and give it a quick hit with a sandblaster. Put a little bit of grain back into it. Leave it at that. There is a small inclusion right on the end, but I'll bet you that goes away in the blast. I'll be back. A little closer look at the cosmetic blend. I am quite pleased with that. That's a good place to start. It's going to clean up nice, and that's you can better see the offset of this and that's caused by both halves of the casting the split line in the casting obviously wasn't realigned properly after they made the imprint in the sand or clay or whatever they did but this is not an investment casting that's for sure and for the files one coarse one extremely fine a little bit of emery a little bit of patience Let's move on. Okay, a little bit deeper look into the very beginning of the crosshead item. Do yourself a favor. Identify which surfaces are going to be cut and which ones are not going to be cut. Personally, I like leaving surfaces cast to be cast. I think it just adds authenticity to the model and it just adds extra time to the build. I'm sure you can clean this up 100% it would look like a jewel but then it would not go with the rest of the model, which is fairly primitive and cast. I am going to go over this part with a caliper, and I am going to just come up with a rough guideline as to exactly how much material lays where, and that will guide my thought process as I develop this piece. You can see that there is no outside dimension, which means this outside here is fair game. But... I don't know, as far as fair game is concerned, that offset is pretty ugly and it sure would be nice if it was symmetrical. Just saying. You can see the blast finish brightens up the casting a little bit, but it does texturize it a little bit to the point that it looks like it might have come out of the box that way. And it's still relatively round. Alright, first step. That's the first step I will do now. Mechanically measure all these surfaces see what I have to work with. Forgive the drawing, I know it's primitive, but it's going to make the point. This is exactly what we have here. You can see the offset in the part. I'm trying to figure out which way to start, which way to come up with a central dimension, find out how much material you can take off. I personally am going to start right here. I'm going to look at the distance between these features. Once I find out the distance between the low spots, 
I'm going to mark that as my center line. You got to start somewhere. Then I know I can take this down this much, I can take this one down this much, and I'll know how far before I start interfering with a finished surface. So I'm going to work from the extreme low spots on the offsets on each side of this casting. First step will be to clean off these little nubs with a nest that jumps the radius. I'm going to start this build with a small piece of aluminum scrap, not a whole lot bigger than the actual part itself. I'm going to create a trough down the center of this part and two flats on either side that are on the same plane and I'm going to use that as a nest to get around all of this stuff on the side so I can clean it up and have some place to start. I will make another one of these for the final geometry of the part and use it for rotational reference when the time comes. Alright, I think the benefit of that is clear. We have straddled the protrusions in the center. I just have an exposed edge on the casting that I can bank a parallel on when I crunch it into the vise. And everything should stay nice and true. So let's go with that. I'm going to open it up just a little bit. I think there's some radiuses, radii on the casting. It may be hanging up on that part. I just don't like the way it slides. Need a little bit bigger at this point. Precision on that slide is not important. 3 8 cutter, we're going 135 off center each way. Let's go a little deeper, too. I have moved this part to the end of the vise so you can get a pretty good feel for exactly what that little nest is going to do. It is going to clamp register the part on the flats on the existing casting because I like it. I'm going to use the high side on the other side like a pin which is perfect because now I have three point contact and I have offset parallels in the bottom so that the nest is not touching anything only the casting at this time. I did make another one of these off camera to the finished dimension, the trough in the aluminum, to the finished dimension of the bosses that I will be cutting. I will have another utility to it. So let's smash this down in here and uh, move it into the center of the vise. I'm going to remove the high side down until it scuffs and flip it, move the high side down until it scuffs. And then I can sit it in there with some type of integrity across parallels 90 degree rotated from what it is right now. One small addition to the setup, just barely visible back here. I put an aluminum shim in there to register on the protrusion on the body because I couldn't be sure that the head wasn't touching the vise and causing a misalignment. So I do have an aluminum shim back there, still a three-point contact. Just going to barely dust this edge. All the material should be coming off the back or the top rear surface.
there is about five ten thousandths maybe worth of existing casting break edge right here that back edge is not even sharp this will be the one that's sharp because you remove more of the material I'm going to flip this around with that boss facing the other direction and I'll do this exact same thing on the other side there's no sense in filming that you just saw the operation only difference being I now have a registration surface a little bit bigger to trust that's it you should now have two very clean surfaces and the X is on there to reference what side of the fixture it was on and the X is also the N so this piece was oriented this way for any reason it needs to go back in there there you go now quick math in your head if you have digital caliper we are looking for this 562 and the reason I squared it up like that is now I can sit it on parallels and establish the first side because I believe the planar alignment is just as critical as the 248 you just 248 shifted this way 248 shifted that way you got a problem so I'm going to sit it on parallels and I'm going to establish it 50 50 you could stand it up you could walk it around with an end mill but then the alignment this way that just becomes an issue so this is the way I choose to do it 562 take your calipers and turn them on zero mount move it up to 562 come on there you go zero it again now close it okay 562 562 is your hard standard when you now measure your part that's how much has to come off 533 and a half so you take whatever value you get after you zero your digital and take it and split it in half that is how much we will move in from this side in from that side in to achieve the 562 so for this dimension I'm going for center and I'm going for half of the 248 or one of the 248 lips based on how thick this is already I'll split the difference Okay, 378, 248, about 130, 65, let's say 65 coming off the face. We are establishing the center of the part, so everything right now should be very well balanced about this diameter. Let's do it. Moving on. We are sitting on some tall parallels on the surfaces that we just cleaned up. All the registration surfaces are banked and oriented against hard stops. So the side that was against the inside of the nest is the side that's sitting on the parallels. In order to find the center of this, I am not going to trust an edge finder. I could, but I'm not going to. I'm going to sweep the jaws, and I'm going to split the difference, and as soon as I have a zero, that's going to be my center line. I will work from the center out to establish the width of this side. part is positioned currently on center. There is approximately 130 worth of excess material on these flanges. I am going to take 65 off of each surface on the top on both sides and establish the 562 minus 2 dimension. Then we'll flip it over keeping this side against the back so we'll just flip it this way do the exact same thing on the other side. I will double check the alignment with the indicator on the flip side that way when I stand it up and blend this upper surface it's nice and clean. Once you've established a semi-boss with a specific number, with a common shift in each direction on whatever axis you're using, mine is my Y, I'm going to take a measurement now. I will compare that measurement to my target, take the difference, split the difference, and I will make that change to the number of the shift that I just made. Now, let's just example... I am 445 right now off center each way using a 312 cutter. 
the target is 437. If the measurement of the part doesn't equal the math, well then the cutter is either cutting oversize or undersize, and I can make my shift now before I go directly to my 437 and ruin this part. I am also about five thousandths off of my final deck of 65 deep. I'll measure it, I'll be back. Final dimension dialed in, let's take a finish cut. Additionally, the first nest that I made to start this process, this guy right here, at the same time and off camera, I made another one to the finished size of that channel. So I can now hold this this way and do whatever work that I need to do, like the vertical stuff. This can also be used as a functional gauge. If you make the nest real tight, dimensionally tight, and it fits the part, well then you know the part must be smaller than the nest. So this is the high side of the tolerance, 562. I'm going to shoot for 561, 560 and a half, something under the 562 so it works well. If this is too small, it'll probably just clap around, but I'm sure it will work just as well so long as the casting is cut accordingly. All right, if this piece was standing vertically, you could establish the 248 width of that flange right there, of that edge, protrusion, boss, whatever you want to call it, rather easily because you could mic it. In a situation like this, where the bank surface is against something where you can't get a micrometer in there, you can't get a caliper in there, you don't want to take the part out and check it for any number of reasons, the way I will set this, and I will guarantee I'll hit that number, is I'll use a depth mic and measure the height of the jaw. To the parallel. Thusly. Knowing, now I'm not going to influence, I'm not going to move anything right now. Do not let this jaw influence the measurement back here. Take your measurement in the back only across the one jaw that you know is stationary to the top of the parallel. Now if we know what that dimension is and you know how thick this boss needs to be, well, all we need to do right now is set that end mill a known distance off of this back surface and that dimension is going to be there all day. For this particular setup, I need to be 12 thousandths above that back jaw. That's not a lot, but I know that these parallels are reliable and I will not hit the jaws. So the center has been established. I swept it again with the indicator, made sure that the zero was where I wanted it. The 435.5 is my digital reading both ways for a finished 562 boss. And as soon as I have that cutter positioned 12 thou off of this surface, that 248 flange is going to be there. All right, reposition the camera. Let's cut it. This is the setup for this operation. I am in the 562 nest. The milling is sitting against, the camera is really hard to get in there, but we are sitting down against the bottom flange. The flange is sitting on a parallel, parallels directly on the vise. Soft pad against the protrusion. And I expect to cut into this for this operation. I'm going to blend these two sides, one to the other, so make sure you are above the vise for that. I'm going to gently bump the front here. Then I'm going to pick up with a pin this boss right here so that I can center it up and drill the hole in. Everything is given from the center of that. 
So the overall length, the length of this, a lot of dimensions fall in once that center is established. So cleaning off that surface is the next step. There are several dimensions that will need to all fall in at the same time. Once this front protrusion, this rib in the center, is cleaned off, do not get too excitable about taking off that face right there. We're going to work from here, from the center here, to the back side, establishing the, the back to the center dimension. And then we're going to work from the back to this edge up here to establish the width of that particular boss. So it's, a, it's quite a domino effect. Do not get too over anxious and cut that off. You'll blow one of the dimensions. For those of you with very good eyes, you saw the back side of that part clean up before the front. I zeroed the dial and I checked the misalignment six tenths, six ten thousandths of an inch. I'll take it for what it does. This is a non-functional surface, but I really want it to blend and look good. So, all right, right now I'm going to establish the center of that round diameter and we'll just figure out uh, what's happening after that. I'm going to put a pin in there and finish this up. I do have to come back and finish all of this stuff blending these faces, this one and the back. So I'd rather not take the cutter out or the part. Let's get the pin. Well, I guess I gotta take the cutter out anyway. Bummer. Knowing the 248 width of that flange, I decided to put an edge finder on it and move over the 124 to center. This should be my reference zero for the center of this boss as well. This is a 500 diameter boss, give or take. I'm going to put a 500 diameter gauge pin in and drop it down and check for the alignment on the X and the visual on the Y. 500 diameter pin in the collet. I like it. You can expect some mismatch or some exposure of the pin in the top but the remaining diameters come together nicely. Alright, this is a pivot end so if it's off a little bit it's not going to matter. So long as it's square to those two slides you should be in good shape. This is where the connecting rod from the crank goes. So the center hole going down on this end is the one that drives the rod through to the valve. So that is more important to be centered. Nope, this one drives the piston. So this is more important to be centered than this one. Both important. Just hit the numbers and you'll be fine. That was a very delicate drilling operation for two reasons. The drill is going to want to dive and grab it unless you have flats on the leading edges, which I do not. And this is an unsupported surface right here. There is nothing under this piece. There is back here, but not where the pressure is. Anytime you do that, you can expect a cantilever. And this would potentially lift in the back side, pivoting about the front edge of the support. And this hole is going to be crooked. So anytime you can support underneath area that you're working on. If not, be extra careful with how much pressure you apply. Let's get a reamer, ream it out. This is a 251 reamer. They're calling out for a 250 hole. They're gonna put a 250 pin in here and choke it with the connecting rod. It has an open adjustable end. I expect this material to close up. I am going to squeak my way through it with a 251 reamer for a nice working fit. I don't normally do that, but boy, you can feel it when it starts to grab that reamer. Do have some rifling in the hole, 
I'm going to put a gauge pin in there on the bench and we will finish the other side momentarily. Once the hole is established, we can use that as the zero point to establish the overall length from the center of the hole, 1 inch 125, and then the 812 on the flange. And this is what that looks like. There's the center of the hole, there's the 812 on the flange, there is the 1 inch 125 dimension on the print right here. We're going to add the radius of the cutter to the 1 inch 125 for the 1 inch 281 to the end. The calculated gap between the center of the hole and the face of that flange is 313. If there's any excess of alignment to the outside of the part at this time, this is when it's going to show up. I'm going to take this 313 dimension, subtract the radius of the cutter for 157. So either end of that vertical boss right now to get to the 812 and hit the 1 inch 125 at the same time, those are the numbers. Let's do it. I did not deburr the hole because this material is going to crown around that hole. I'm going to use that as my witness material when I blend that face. The crown around that hole should disappear before anything else on that surface. I will have to cut through this to leave a witness surface back here that I will blend when I stand this part 90 degrees for the end hole. The face of this piece is not going to clean up at the recommended dimension. The 812 is not going to be present on this part. With that quarter inch hole centered in the boss, visually with the pin, it will be visually centered. This surface right here, the front of this one, will not clean up. So just to keep it nice and clean, in my opinion, it is a non-functional surface. It does not do anything, doesn't hit anything, doesn't bank anything, doesn't locate anything. It's strictly cosmetic. The overall length I don't know about, so we're going to leave the overall length at 1 inch 125 from center. The little notch that I put in the end, you can see a little notch right there. That is a witness mark. When this thing is rotated vertically, that is going to be the surface I will shoot for since I'm not going to be able to find that hole when I flip it. So I'm going to clean that up, blend off that red, and call this side done. Thirteen thou beyond. That flag should measure seven ninety nine as opposed to the eight twelve on the print. that surface and flip it over. I am back in my 562 nest for the vertical operation so the part is standing upright. You can see that little shelf right there on the end is my target depth set when I did the hole on the first side. I'm going to deck this entire rear surface off to that little witness mark. Tram it left to right, find the center, drill and tap a 1032 hole right there. If for any reason you are unsure about the vertical nature of your nest or your part, run a square up against one of the outside edges. Doesn't hurt to be safe. That is beautiful. Okay, snug it up, knock it down. Witness mark on the end is complete. The end is finished. Center it up, drill and tap. Sweep the outside of the part and find the center of those two flanges before you tap your hole.
edge finder for the rest. Ten thirty two drill and tap right in the middle. Okay, last night I wrapped this part up at around 5.30 it was when I walked out of the shop. The only thing left to do is split this for where the connecting rod comes in, but this is a mid-video warning for all of you guys, girls. As you saw when I was using the nest here for my location, which worked out very well, since this is an irregular side, you're going to have to put something in there to take up the slack. And those of you with good eyes can see exactly what I'm pointing at right now. This material is very, it, it machines really well, taps and drills like titanium, it's very uh, constrictive. And it, superficially you would think it's, it's tough, but apparently it is not. This little dent right here is from the aluminum pad that I used to assure that it was seated correctly when I closed it. I did not want this to influence rotation at all. So you use wire, use a piece of aluminum, whatever. Okay, let's get to the whole copper wire thing. Look at this little surprise. Can you see it? Right there. Well, when you move material, it's got to go somewhere. And you can see it right there. That is compression from a piece of copper wire. Of all things copper. Copper is so dead soft it's not even funny. So that would tell me that this is softer than copper. If a piece of copper wire can do that kind of damage to a part. Well, surprise, surprise. Needless to say it is non-functional surface right here. Cosmetically I'll just position it down so you don't see it. But I know it's there and it's going to bother me forever. But I figured I would put you on the path to not doing that. So when you, whatever you do, however you decide to locate that, please realize that this stuff is a lot softer than it appears. And it's going to take a little bit of file work to get that out of there. So that it doesn't hang up or influence how easily this thing slides. That's what I'm going to do off camera. Then I'm going to sit it back in the machine sitting on that flat surface. Sequence of operations, right? Now we have a parallel surface to deal with, and I will split it. You could do that with a splitting saw, slitting saw, or an end mill. I am going to do it with an end mill, just because I'm more comfortable with an end mill. I'm going to use the nest as well. All right, let me file those off. We'll set it up, split it, get it done. Beware. Next operation in line is the 200 slot in the center. That is about five millimeters. And I like the way they have this dimension. They have it dimensioned from the center of the hole to the bottom of the slot. That would assure that no matter where that radius, where this hole is positioned in relationship to that radius, that the connecting rod will pivot once it's installed. So let's take a look at the setup. I took my original 562 channeled out aluminum block and having learned my lesson from the copper trick I'm going to nest it this way. I am going to register on surfaces I can trust and surfaces that I know. Sweeping the part true to the setup I will establish the center line of that boss and I will register the bottom of my 3 16 end mill on the top of the 250 pin that I will stick through that hole. I will come down the 125 to find center and I will go 375 from there. Simple setup. 
This should be the easiest feature of the whole part. Everything you need is already there. Let's do it. Part is indicated true to the x-axis. The height is set from the center of the hole down 375. I'm going to pick at this with a 3 16 end mill and then walk it side to side to establish the 200 required dimension. This particular process could probably be done with this part laying down and using a slitting saw if you have one of the correct size or if you're comfortable enough to walk one. If you're going to use an end mill, make sure your flute length is sufficient. If it's not sufficient, make sure that the diameter of the end mill does not exceed the flute diameter. That way you can get past and instead of going right for it, you can see I am about 80% of the way into this hole. You can see the end of the cut right there. I will do the top portion of this slot to make sure that I can achieve the dimension I'm looking for based on the cutter. And then I will drop down to final depth and clean it up. If you try that and the top half of the cutter is into the slot and is not cutting, it is going to push and end up in an absolutely catastrophic feature. So let me go grab a pin so we can check this as I'm doing it. Be right back. That's a wrap. Deburred. Okay, the final product. There you go. Put the right size pin in there. Two fifty. It is. Two fifty through the center. See the small indentation from the copper wire and the aluminum pad that I pointed out. Well, if nothing else, it shows that I banked off the same side consistently, which is a good thing. I ended up taking the original two or the original one nest, and cutting it in half to two. It came in real handy in the later ops. 562. 1032 hole in the back. And the only surface that I would just disagree with the amount of stock left was the face of these ears. You can bump the hole back about 10, 15 thousandths if you want so that cleans up to spec. But the length center line to the end is spot on. The width is spot on. From here to the bottom is there. The center is there. The length of this leg right here on both sides is about... 13 thousandths shy of the print. It's about 7.99 as it sits. It's non-functional, so it really doesn't matter, but it just bothers me not to be able to hit a number. The dents are filed out. The 562 does slide over that real nice. There's two thousandths worth of clearance on the frame as drawn. If you hit dimensions and don't just work by eye, it should slide nicely. But if you want to work by eye and just use this as a functional gauge, that would be just perfectly fine too. For what it is, it's only a model. It's just strictly going to slide back and forth. Actually, this is going to go to the piston, so... And the rod itself is going to go on this end. 
this little guy here. We'll slip that in there ultimately and there you go. Another one in the books. Done. Put the pretty side up for the pick. There you go. Beauty shot right there. Hope you like that one. Thanks for watching. Stay well. Joe Pie, I'm out.